Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? <clears throat> Some of you are still asleep. That is okay. We're still excited to see you. Hey, super quick, if this is your very first time at any one of our campuses, our Banta campus, our Franklin campus, our Garfield Park campus, our Seymour campus here at Greenwood or online, if this is your very first time, we want to give you a very special welcome. Can we give it up for all of our first-time guests? Someone thought it was very important for you to be here. Thank you for accepting their invitation. They feel like you will be blessed by what's going on in and through Emmanuel Church. And for the rest of you who are not brand new, your return visitors, return guests, regular attenders, we love you. Welcome back to you as well. Starting a brand new series today called Treat Yourself. How many of you have ever seen Parks and Rec? Ever see it? Hands up. Okay, how many of you have not seen Parks and Rec? Okay, a lot of you, okay. If you've seen Parks and Rec, it's kind of, it's a TV show, similar to The Office. I think it was maybe the same creators. Uh, it's a comedy. It's pretty funny stuff. Um, you know what this phrase means, treat yourself, okay. You, you've heard it. You've seen it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I think you'll catch along here. The, the idea in the show is that once a year, you know, a couple of the people on the show, they, have, they spend this day, you know, just say, hey, today is going to be a day where we do everything thing for ourselves. And you know, they, they buy clothes, they buy cupcakes, whatever it is that they do. It's, it's, it's very, very funny. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. And, and I, we started to talk about this idea of, of treat yourself or treat yourself, if you want to say grammatically correct, that, you know, it really is a philosophy of life today that people believe in their heart that life is really about getting yours and, go, and being selfish and, and you, you be you and you do you and you go get yours and, and, and life is about me, myself, and I. And that really is a philosophy today that the way to find happiness is to be selfish, to watch your own back. And I just, we, we were just talking about this, you know, a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago. We said, man, that is just so not true. I mean, is that really the path to happiness in life? Does that really provide a person with lasting satisfaction and fulfillment? I mean, think, of a, think about a marriage where each individual person in the marriage is saying, I'm going to get mine. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to treat myself. How does that marriage work out? Some of you are like, man, that was my first marriage. <laughs> that ended in divorce, you know. How does it work out between a father and a son where, where you know, the, the son is saying, I'm going to go after mom, I'm going to treat myself. And the dad is saying, I'm going to treat myself. How does that work out in a business partnership where both business partners are like, I'm going to watch my back. I don't care, really care about you, but I'm just going to treat myself. I'm going to put myself first. Some of you are like, man, I was in a business partnership like that one time. And it ended quickly. I mean, selfishness destroys relationships. It is not the path towards happiness. What is the path towards happiness? Is there a different way? Is there a different approach to life? I believe there is. In your notes, what if, what if the best way to live was to be a gift giver? Instead of a gift receiver, instead of someone saying, treat me, treat me, treat me, what if the best way to live was to, to be about others and to think about others and to be a gift giver to others. A couple of years ago, we did a series called Life Verse, and I wasn't able to participate in that series because I was on study break. It was over the summertime. I take about four or five weeks off. And, uh, but it was an exciting series. Some of you may remember it, but I never got a chance to share my life verse. Like out of the whole Bible, a life verse, if you don't know what a life verse is, it's basically a, a verse that you pick that's sort of like a, a theme for your life or a metaphor for your life. And, and it's a powerful, it could be a powerful idea. Years ago, when I was in college, I came across my life verse. I want to share it with you today. It's Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Here's what it says. For me to live, or for to me to live is Christ, and to die 
is gain, which is an odd statement. This is written by the Apostle Paul, who was once a guy named Saul, and he had this massive conversion experience, and Jesus literally knocked him off a horse and opened up his eyes to see who Christ, who he was, and, and he went on to you know, become one of the most influential Christ followers in, in history, if not the most influential Christ follower, planted churches, and gave his life to take the gospel to the world and was persecuted for it and locked up. In fact, this letter in Philippians, he wrote it from a jail cell because he was locked up for preaching the gospel. And he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What does that mean? Paul is saying, like, if I'm going to be alive, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to teach about Jesus. I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to honor Jesus. I'm going to glorify Jesus. And if I should happen to die, it's gain. Which makes you think, okay, what, did he have a death wish? Was he suicidal? Like, what, what was going on with this guy? This is kind of a weird life verse, Danny. You're kind of freaking me out. Let me explain. Let me explain. The Apostle Paul at one point was brought up into heaven supernaturally, and God showed Paul what was going on in heaven. He gave him an inside peek into what was coming in the future. And so Paul knows, knew, he knew what the future held for himself. He saw the angels. He saw Christ in heaven. And so he, and then he came back to earth, and it's like, well, this place sucks. <laughs> and it's beautiful, and I know the earth is wonderful, and I know there's, there's a lot, there's family here, and there's a lot of beauty here, and there's a lot of goodness here. But man, there is so much brokenness and corruption and sin and death. And Paul's like, it's better to die. I've seen it. I've been there. And then he goes on to explain this tension. Listen to what he says. If I'm going to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, if I'm going to stay alive, I'm going to get to work producing good things for God. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between these two options, he says. I desire to depart and to be with Christ. I've seen it. I've been there. I've touched it. I've tasted it, which is far better. And then he says this, but... It is more necessary for, say it with me, for you that I remain in the body. And then he says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain in this body, I will stay alive, and I will continue with all of you, watch this, for, say it with me, your progress and your joy in the faith. See, Far from Paul being a person who lived out this philosophy of treat yourself, <laughs> he lived out the philosophy of my life is here for you. Like the whole purpose of, of my, my, fit, my presence on earth is for your progress and for your joy in the faith. Paul dedicated his life to give gifts to others. And he's writing this letter from a jail cell. People need help today. Have you noticed? People need help. They're discouraged, they're depressed, they're anxious, angry, worried, fearful, discouraged, down, beaten down, frustrated, behind on their bills, filled with anxiety. People need a lot of help today. Paul simply said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna dedicate my life to the service of others. You know who understood this? Martin Luther King Jr. understood this. He's got a lot of great quotes. And, and uh, he, did some ama he, he did some amazing things with his life. I wonder why. It's because he saw his life this way. In fact, one of my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quotes says this. Life's most persistent and urgent question is this. Not what can I get for myself. Not how am I going to treat myself. But rather, what are you doing for, say it with me, others. Is that really life's most persistent and urgent question? Yes, why? Because your whole purpose on this planet is to be a blesser, to be a giver of gifts to the people around you, not to be selfish. But, oh, this is hard to absorb, isn't it? I mean, it's, we're just selfish to the core. Is anybody else willing to admit it? I am selfish to the core. And maybe it had something to do with the fact that I grew up as a, as a uh, you know, a, a, the youngest of, of, of three kids, and I was the baby. Any, else, any babies in the, house, in the house? Baby, baby brothers, baby sisters? Yeah. Something, probably something to do with that. One of my favorite books, or probably my favorite book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. The reason I say that is because this book helped me to see the world clearly. One, one statement that Lewis makes it's so powerful. He says, the moment that you have a self or that you realize that you, 
become aware of your existence, that you have a soul and you have a self. The moment that happens, there's the possibility of putting yourself, what? First. Wanting to be the center of attention. Wanting to be God, in fact. That is the sin of Satan, and that was the sin that he taught the human race. We all struggle with being selfish. What about me? How come you don't recognize me? How come I didn't make the team? Why wasn't I invited? Right? Well, our whole world revolves around ourselves. And because of that, we're always frustrated and we're always offended. Last week, Pastor Ayer did a great job talking about complaining. Why do we complain so much? Because people aren't doing what we want them to do for us. So we complain and we moan and we leave marriages over this. We leave jobs over this. We leave churches over this. They're not doing what I want. I'm offended. We're cent- we, we put ourselves at the center of attention. When I was a little kid, uh, I just mentioned I was the baby in the family. And, and I remember being like five or six or seven years old. And when, my, when I was thirsty, when we were at, sitting at dinner, uh, I would take my cup and here's what I would do. No joke, no lie, my family still, still gets on me for this. And I'd, you know what my mom would do? My mom would go over and grab my cup. She'd go up, fill it with juice or high C or what fruit punch or milk, or whatever we were drinking that night. I didn't even have to say, mom, can I have more to drink? I just <laughs> shook my cup. So as the baby, you can see the selfishness, the world revolves around me. And then I'll I'll never forget when I was 19 years old, my parents dropped me off at a place called Liberty University. By the way, if you have kids, send them there. Lynchburg, Virginia, check it out. They dropped me off 400 miles away from New York City and, and, and they left. They left. They went back home. I'm there by myself. I'm in a dorm room. And the first week was great. You know, I had clean underwear and some clean shirts and some clean pants. And then about six days in, I had no underwear left. And I'm looking around like, where's my clean laundry? Like, it's usually just folded right there. It just shows up. Mama wasn't there. And I suddenly realized I was all alone. No one was coming to rescue me. No one was coming to do my laundry. And I had to start asking questions like, hey, how do you do laundry? Where's the laundromat? How does it work? Oh, you need quarters. Quarters, what do you need quarters for? (laughs) And I had to start doing my own laundry. One of the best things you could do for a children when they turn 18 is send them away. (laughs) Send them far away. Because you realize no one's coming to save you. And you're all alone. In your notes, I wrote it like this. A life spent waiting for others to bless you and serve you and fill your cup up will be a life of constant disappointment. Some of you are constantly disappointed because you are at the center of your story and people are not serving and blessing you. Can I just say something that I wish more people would say and I'll say it and I know I'm going to get some emails for it so that's okay. No one owes you anything. Nothing. No one owes you a dime. Stop waiting around for people to bless you and gift you and serve you. And it's not, you will be constantly disappointed. See, I think we need a whole new approach to life. I think we need to, I I think we need to look at life completely differently. What if we saw life the way Paul saw it? I mean, what what would happen if, if we just took the approach that Paul, like, like my hope, my whole purpose for being on earth is to Bless you and serve you for your progress and joy in the faith. I'd rather go to heaven because I've seen it. Jesus is there. There's no corruption. There's no cancer. There's no crime. There's no sin. There's no death. Like, I'd rather go there, but, 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 but I'm going to stay here for your benefit. What if you took that approach with life? That's why it's my life first. That's why I'm a pastor today and not a businessman or, or something else with my life. Why, why have I dedicated my life to serve you as your pastor? It's for, because of Philippians 1.21. It's the only thing that really makes sense in this life is to bless and serve others. And I don't do it perfectly, and some of you are thinking, well, you haven't blessed me, you haven't served me. I know, I know. I'm not saying I'm great at it. In fact, sometimes I really suck at it. 
But I'm trying my best to serve you. My, like my whole existence is on this planet, and what our, our staff is to bless and to serve, people on the impact team to bless and to serve others. It's the only thing that makes sense. There's, there's eight billion of us on this planet. How could it be, a, treat myself, treat yourself? How could that be the right philosophy of life? Come on, is this, does that make sense at all? Eight billion of us, treat myself, treat myself, treat myself. Really? That makes no sense whatsoever. I read a poem a few years ago by a, a woman named Teresa of Avila. She was uh, a theologian of, of, of the soul in a sense, and, and she's kind of famous in the, in the Catholic uh, realm. What a powerful poem. L- listen to these words she wrote. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. This, 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 to me, this brings all of life into clarity. The purpose of why we are here is to bless others, to be the hands and the feet and the heart and the, and the, the, the love of Jesus Christ. How, how else would Jesus bless this world? How would he do it if he's not going to do it through you, through your resources, through your service, through your heart, through your voice, through your hands? How else would he bless the world? So at this point in the sermon, I was imagining backstage that all of you would be like, okay, I get it. Makes sense. What would I give? Pastor Danny, you're so right. You're so right. I've been selfish. Treat yourself is all wrong. What would I give? Are you there? Are you there? Because I have to think about this stuff to encourage myself. (laughs) Are you there? I hope you are. What would you give? Now, some of you are thinking, oh gosh, he's going to talk about money again. Ah, okay. We did that last series. We're not going to talk about money. By the way, you guys did a great, you're doing a great job. We've seen an increase. Last week was over $200,000 for the offering. So great job. Great job. Awesome. Thank you for responding. When everybody does a little bit, it adds up to a lot of it. So what would you give? What would you give beyond your money? Well, this is our Christmas series, and, and so what we're going to do is look into this, the Christmas story to kind of figure out what would we give. And the answer when you look at the Christmas story is, is, is very simple. We would give what God has given to us, which is in the Christmas story we find out really quick is joy. Joy. That is what we give. That is what the world needs. That is what people need in this life. Joy. They need a lot of things, but what they need at the core of their being is this thing called joy. What is joy? Let's put a definition out there so that we know what we're talking about. Joy is a pervasive sense of well-being that's not connected to your circumstances. That's what it is. It's this overall feeling in your soul that it all, everything's good. It's a, it's, you can almost use the word peace, wellness in your life. And it has nothing to do with getting the loan or getting the raise or your kid is healthy or the diagnosis was, you know, you know, not cancer. It has nothing to do with circumstances going good or bad. It's just, it has everything to do with something else. And that is Jesus. Let's look at the Christmas story together. Now, some of you remember the Christmas story really well as kids because of Charlie Brown. Anybody else out there? Linus would get up there and he would read the Charlie Brown story. And I just, that's how I became really super familiar with it, you know, and he would read it every Christmas. And we, I just love that, 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 that whole episode. But if you don't remember what Linus said, let's look at it in Luke chapter 2. So basically in Luke chapter 2, there's this, uh, the, the emperor there says, uh, uh, we're going to do a census. And so everybody's got to go to their town their, uh, where they grew up to be counted. And so Joseph who takes Mary, and they're, they're engaged at this time, and Mary's pregnant. He has to take her all the way to Jerusalem because that's where he was born. He was a, a descendant of King David. And so while they're there getting ready to be counted in the census, Mary goes into labor and she gives birth to Jesus in a a barn. 
in a barn. The reason why they're in a barn is they, all, the, the, all the hotels were filled up. I don't think they called them hotels back then, but you know what I mean. So there's no rooms, and, they, and, and can you imagine giving birth in a barn? I mean, it's just, in, I've seen it happen three, time, three times in a hospital, and it was messy in the hospital. <laughs> and we had all kinds of rags and suction things and all things kind of going gone. It was just like, you know, everybody's disinfected. Can you imagine giving birth in a barn? I just, it's, 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 it blows my mind. Anyway, she gives birth, no epidural, she gives birth to Jesus in the barn. Lots of pain, lots of screaming, lots of blood, lots of dung on the ground and animals mooing in the back. I mean, it's just a, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. Jesus comes out, they clean him off, they wrap him up in swaddling clothes, they place him in a, in a feeding trough, in a manger. And at that same time, there were some shepherds out in the field guarding their, their, uh, their sheep there. And all of a sudden, this, this angel comes out of nowhere and, and it says that the radiance of this, this angel was just shining all around them. I mean, who knows, this, this, this angel is probably, you know, 12 feet tall. We, we don't know, but this is, this is a, an angelic being from heaven that comes down and is glowing in front of them. And so because of that, they were terrified as you would have been and I would have been if you put yourself there in that situation. Look, look, look what it says. They were terrified, scared to death. Some of them probably lost control of their... Because <laughs> that's what happens when you're terrified. But the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Don't be terrified. Why? Why? And then he gives us this answer. So maybe one of the greatest statements in the Bible. I bring you good news that will bring you, say it with me, great joy. Not just regular joy. Not a small amount of joy. But massive amounts of joy. Great joy that will be for all people on planet earth. You want to know what Christmas is about? It's, it's about joy entering the world for you and for your neighbor and for your brother and for your sister and for your enemy and for the person you hate. Everyone. That's what Christmas is about. And what is the source of this joy? If it's not your circumstances going right, what is it? Listen to what the angel says. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of of David. Let me, say, let me explain what this means. They had been waiting for a savior, someone to save them from the oppression of the Roman government. They had been waiting for the one who parted the Red Sea and allowed their ancestors to walk through on dry ground and then closed up the Red Sea on the Egyptians to save them. The Savior, the one who closed the mouths of the lions to save Daniel in the lion's den. They had been waiting for the one who could rescue them and deliver them. And finally he was here. You talk about joy. The Messiah, that word means the anointed one, the one that has God's spirit on him. This is the one the Old Testament foretold. Joy, he's here. The Lord, what is the word Lord? The Lord means master, master over all events, master of the universe. He's in control of all of the circumstances. The Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem. And that is the source of your joy. And that is the source of my joy. You know, in Christianity, there's this uh, ritual called communion. We have some others, baptism. And we do communion every so often, once a quarter or so. And what is communion? Well, communion is this idea where we, we take a little bit of a, a piece of bread like this. And we eat it, and then we take a little bit of juice or wine or whatever, and we drink it, and we all do it together. And, and, and the purpose of communion is to take Jesus symbolically into our bodies. Like the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us, and the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us. And so we eat it and we drink it. Why do we do that? Well, Jesus called himself the living water. He called himself the bread of life, the bread from heaven. We do that because we're supposed to take Jesus into ourselves by faith. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. And we are to look to him. We are to trust in him. We are to depend on him. We are to hope in him. We are to count on him. We are to believe in him. And that is how we take him in. And then we do this thing called communion to symbolize the taking in of Jesus into our soul, into our body. 
Now, if you're from a Catholic background, you believe in something called transubstantiation. Say that five times. Transubstantiation. What is transubstantiation? Transubstantiation is this idea that when you eat the bread, it actually becomes the body of Jesus when you eat it. The physical body of Jesus. Something happens, there's a miracle that happens to the bread, you eat it, and you take the body of Christ into yourself. And then in the same way, when you drink the juice, it literally becomes the blood of Jesus as you ingest it, as you drink it down into yourself. Transubstantiation. You're familiar with that if, you have, if you're from a Catholic background. Now, we, we don't believe that at this church, but it's not a terrible idea. If it is real. Why? Because that's the whole purpose of the New Testament, is to take Christ into ourselves by faith, which is why Catholics do it every single week. Have you ever wondered that? Well, how come we don't take communion like the Catholics do every single week, every single week? Well, they believe that the more communion you take, the more of Jesus you have inside of you. Does that make sense? Yes? Because we don't believe that, we don't do it every single week. But it's still a good idea. And it's still a ritual that Christ gave us. Why? Because he wants us to hope in him, to trust in him, to count on him. And in doing so, we take him into ourselves. We take his spirit into ourselves. And what happens when we take his spirit into us? By the way, communion is just one way to symbolically do that. Prayer, meditation, silence, solitude, fasting, scripture memory, community group. Or many, there's many ways to take Christ into your soul, into your body. What happens when we take Christ into us by faith? Well, we receive this thing called joy. His joy comes into our soul. That's the whole purpose of Christmas. Good news that will bring great joy for all people. The Savior, the Messiah is born. And he's come to live and dwell in your hearts in the form of the Spirit. If you think of the, uh, the passage in Galatians, those of you familiar with the Bible, in Galatians chapter 5, it says, the fruit of the Spirit, or the result of living in step with the Spirit, is love, and what's the next one? Joy. You live in step with the Spirit, and all of a sudden, these things called love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control, they begin to well up inside of you and develop inside of you. Joy. Christmas is about joy coming into the world. People need joy, don't they? They do. I mean, there is a pervasive, I'm not talking about like a, just an epidemic of anger and depression and discontent in this world today. Have you picked it up? Have you seen it? Has it infected you? Are you discouraged? Are you down? Are you angry? Are you mad? Are you complaining all the time? Are you disappointed all the time? It's just like a, like a blanket that's covered us. Along with sexual perversion, it, it, it's, it's just like these two things. The sexual perversion of, of, uh, and, and anger and discontent has covered our world today. How do you fight that? Well, I know of only one way to fight it. And that is joy. See, in your notes, I wrote it like this. Joy gives people strength for life. Joy gives people strength. See, that's my secret. Not that you're asking for my secret of how I live, but let's, let's just pretend like you asked. Because <laughs> I have problems. You understand I have problems? Some people think I'm weird, like I don't have problems. You know, sometimes I'll go into a grocery store, people look at me like, oh, it's Pastor Danny. Why is he in the grocery store? You know how you used to do that with your teachers and when you were a little kid? It's like, there's my teacher. What are they doing here? Well, they need food, honey. <laughs> I am a normal person. I've got massive problems. I've got enough problems right now that if I were to list them out to you, and you could tell me about your problems, that's fine. I'm your pastor. That's good. We'll do that. But I've got problems too. I've got enough problems right now that if I focused on my problems and my circumstances, I'd be depressed and discouraged. I'd be down. I might even want to quit. I'm not talking about some sort of emotional situation that's connected to my circumstances. I'm talking about joy that supersedes your circumstances. My secret to living on, 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 on being joyful and able to smile in the midst of difficult circumstances is joy, pure 
joy. Listen to what Nehemiah said. Don't be dejected or sad because the joy of the Lord is yours. Say it with me. Strength. There's strength. Joy gives strength to life. Think about it. Think about it. If you can get your mind off of, off of the circumstances and the, the, the difficulties of life and get it onto the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has come. He is here and he wants to live in you and dwell in you and walk with you every single day of your life. If that is where your mind and heart is focused and that is where your trust is going and you're doing things like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your paths smooth and straight. You're doing that sort of stuff every single day. The Lord's the master of the universe. He's master over my circumstances. This isn't gonna get me down. He's the savior. He's the one that shut the mouths of the lions in the lion's den. He's the one that parted the Red Seas. He's living in my heart. Is my circumstance impossible for him? Not a chance. And so my secret to living and having joy in the midst of difficulty is Jesus. He's with me. He's with you. In fact, that's what Christmas is all about. Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? It's the name of our church. What does it mean? God with us. And when he's with us and you're aware of that, and you're walking with him, and you're talking with him, you find this thing called joy. And joy gives you strength for life. So what's my challenge to you today? Well, the whole, the whole point of this series is to be a gift giver. What am I gonna challenge you to give? Not your money, but joy. To be a giver of joy, to give it out. And in order to do that, you have to be joyful. <laughs> you can't be Eeyore. I mean, Eeyore's so sad, they took him out of Winnie the Pooh. They, they cut him out. He's not even in there anymore. Remember Mr. Krabs from, from SpongeBob SquarePants? You can't be Mr. Krabs. He's just crabby all the time. You can't give out joy if you're one of those Christ followers that's always disgruntled. You know, Paul wrote this letter in Philippians chapter uh, Paul wrote Philippians, the whole book, from a jail cell. And in chapter 4, he's saying, rejoice evermore, be joyful. He had joy when he was locked up. You say, well, Pastor Randy, I don't know how to be joyful. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm more like Eeyore. I'm more like Mr. Krabs. I don't like life. People disappoint me. I'm a... How do you do that? Jesus, in John chapter 15, tells us, he says, here's the situation. Here's, here's a metaphor for life. John 15 will change your life if you really get into it especially verse five and verse 11, watch this. In John 15, Jesus says, here's how life works. I am like the trunk of the tree or the vine. Like if you think of like a, 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 a vineyard and there's a main branch that comes out of the ground, the vine, okay? He says, I'm the vine. The life-giving sap's coming out of me. It's in me. You guys are the what? The branches that come off the vine. If you as a branch will remain or stay connected or another version says abide in me, then you're going to bring forth what? Lots of fruit, lots of joy, lots of peace, lots of love, lots of patience. You're, like there's going to be lots of fruit in your life. Why? Because the life-giving sap that's in the trunk or in the vine is flowing up in me into you and producing all kinds of grapes of all, all different types. But apart from me, how much can you do? Nothing. No joy, no peace. So when you see a Christ follower who's just grumpy all the time, sad, discouraged, down, you know what you're looking at is a branch that has been disconnected from the vine. And so in order to be joyful, every single day you have to commit your life to be close to Jesus. You know, I spend time with God every single morning, every single morning. Did it again this morning, reading through the one-year Bible, prayer, meditation, reading. Not so that I can stand up here and tell you, hey, I do my devotions every day and I'm committed to Christ. No, come on, that's silly. That would, that would stroke my ego. The reason I spend time with God every single day is because I have to stay connected. Because apart from Jesus, I can do how much? Nothing. It'll be a house of cards. It'll all fall apart. There'll be no depth, no roots to my life. I have to walk with Jesus. There'll be no joy. And this, what's true for me is true for you. I did this stuff before I was a pastor. Walked and talked and tried to follow the Spirit in my life. And then when you do that, Jesus says something incredible happens. Look at verse 11. When you, when you remain, when you stay connected to the vine, 
Watch what happens. Jesus said, I've told you these things. What things? That I am the vine, you guys are the branches. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with what? My joy. Can you believe it, folks? Can you believe that God says, this is unbelievable, this is supernatural stuff. I don't even expect you to believe it because it's kind of miraculous. In fact, if you don't believe it, I understand. But Jesus says that if you stay connected to me, here's what will happen. The joy that is in my soul will flow out of me and into you. And here's what the end result will be. Yes, your joy, it's like my joy and your joy will become one and it will overflow. Like a, like a, like a, 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 a waterfall. And it's going to be all over the place. And everyone you come in contact with is going to get them all messy. And it's just going to spill on them. And people will be like, oh, you know, get away from me. Or, or, or I want some more of it. Right? Because you'll have so much joy in your life, it'll be overflowing. How do you become a gift giver of joy? Be joyful. Stay connected. And Jesus' joy will flow into you and it will flow out to other people. Like, I'm telling you guys, this isn't a sermon. This isn't a talk. This is the way life works. This is the way it was designed to work. Treat yourself is not a good philosophy of life. Giving your life away, viewing your life as a gift to others for their progress and joy in the faith, that is the way God has designed you. And when you do that, you just find levels of happiness that you didn't even really know existed. So this Christmas, this Christmas, who will you give joy to? It's a simple question. Who is it? You start with the person next to you. <laughs> you know, my, I want, I want my, my favorite person on earth is my wife. Her name's Jackie. Many of you know her. I, wanna, I want my joy to spill all over her. You know, I want to be a blessing to her. I want to give it out to her. Then my kids, you know, my three teenagers. And then, you know, the next person, my staff, and then you guys and people I meet in the community just want to splash some joy. On them. Don't they need it? Don't they need it? I mean, people walking around all sad and discouraged. They need joy. They need joy. And, and it's your responsibility to give it. As we wrap up today, let me, let me uh, share a thought and then we'll close. The angel said, I bring you good noise that, good news, good noise. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior has been born today. You know, you and I need saved. We do. We need saved from our sins. We're born into this world selfish, ego-centered, wanting to be God. If you have ever had children, you understand it. It's in them. It's in you. We need to be saved from our sin. Jesus is the Savior. First John chapter 4 says it like this. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son, the Savior. To do what? To set up a religion? Church? So we can sing some songs and hear some sermons? No. That's not why Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? You tell me. To be a what? A sacrifice. Someone had to pay for sin. Is it going to be you or is it going to be me? Or is it going to be him? So God, because he loved us, sent his son as a sacrifice to do what? To take away our sins. Is anybody excited about that? Is anybody thankful for that? Jesus came to save us from our sins. You're a sinner. It's not popular to say that today. <gasps> Can I, be, I, remember, I remember not too long ago, a lady came down front here and she was so offended. You're calling me a sinner? She said, I've got a kid back there in the children's department. Are you telling my son that he's a sinner? I said, ma'am, yes, I am. We have all blown it. What does sin mean? It means to miss the mark. That's what the term means. We've all missed the mark. None of us are perfect. We've lied, cheated, stolen. We've done things, manipulated, been deceitful, lustful, adulterous. We've all blown it. There's no one here that's perfect. And we need to be saved from that sin. Well, Jesus is the sacrifice to take away our sins. When he died on that cross, your sin was transferred to him. And when you trust him, you can receive his righteousness, his forgiveness. Maybe this is your moment. I'm going to say a simple prayer. It's a prayer of faith. If all that made sense to you in the last couple of moments, move towards God in faith. Put your hope in him. Put your trust in him. Ask him to take away your sins. He's already done it. Ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you. And I'm going to say a quick prayer to lead you 
in that decision. If you feel led to do that right now, just bow your head and close your eyes. You're not joining a religion. You're not joining a church. You're beginning a relationship with God. Just say this to him. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me enough to be the sacrifice for my sin, for taking away my sin, for dying in my place. I ask you to to forgive me, to cleanse me, to wash me, make me clean. I ask you to be my savior, my Messiah, my Lord. Fill me with your spirit as I put my trust in you today. And from this day forward, help me to be a person who's willing to sacrifice for others, who's willing to be a gift giver to others because that's what you were. You gave your life for me. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Can we give give God glory, guys? Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, I wanna put something in your hands. Our church wants to put something in your hands called a save box. Somebody did this for me when I was just getting started. They put a Bible in my hands. Inside this box, there's a Bible to get you started. There's a reading plan. There's some instructions on how to get connected to the church, small group, baptism. And there's also a coffee mug in here to say congratulations. And so if you would text the word SAVE to 65248, you can go back uh, to the information desk at your campus and pick one of these up. Or if you're watching online, you can give us a little bit more information and we'll send one of these to you in the mail. One more time, church, can we give God glory? Amen. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to dismiss to the local teams. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much. Thank you for changing the Apostle Paul's life. Thank you for this passage in Philippians that says it's, it's better to stay alive for the benefit of others. Help us to be people who see life that way. Who see that true happiness and fulfillment comes by giving our lives away, not being self-centered not treating ourselves. God, work in our lives, work through us. Let us be your hands and your feet in this world to bless others. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Right now, I'm gonna hand things off to the local teams. God bless you. See you next week. Bring a friend.